trains. They've been the backbone of Britain for nearly 200 years. First Great Western run the most complex fleet in the UK. It's every little boy's dream to become a train driver. Operating on an iconic network. It's an electrifying environment for me. There's always a buzz. Every day, an army of drivers, engineers and workers keep this train set on track. Coming up, they're seriously squeezed at Henley. Ah. Come on, girls. Quick, breathe in. Hold some safety, guys. You don't want to be out here that aggressive. If you want to mess us about, hasta la vista, Henley on Thames. Oh, yeah! It's going pear-shaped at Paddington. I'm going to have to sit here till the morning. That is absolutely bonkers. And there's drama in the driver's cab. I did think I'd had basically killed him. I never, ever want to go through that again. It's every driver's worst nightmare. Great Western Railways operate over a vast 2,000 kilometres of track, connecting the capital with Wales and the southwest. One of the shortest stretches of line runs between Twyford and Henley, and it's used chiefly by commuters. Bye bye. Bye bye. But there are five days in July when it turns into the busiest branch line in Britain. With up to 35,000 people shunted between stations. This sudden passenger surge is thanks to the Henley Royal Regatta, the world's most well-known boat race, which attracts thousands of visitors of all types from the Tofts to the rank and file and pushes this short stretch of track to its limits. Round the table, gentlemen, we'll do our briefing round the table. It's Regatta Saturday and with record crowds expected, Revenue Protection Officer Dave Bunyan has been drafted into Henley Station to manage the crowds and track down anyone travelling without a ticket. We're looking at probably a 1,000 people at a time. It's probably one of the best office in the world I've ever had. Lots of people come into my office and nearly everybody leaves it. Deal with those passengers who are genuine in a proper and professional manner. Those scallies that are trying it on, I leave it to your discretion, ladies and gentlemen. For the next five hours, it's going to be fun. This is the ring area. So I'm going to be the ringmaster. I crack the whip, tell them, keep it moving. Henley Station sits at the end of a four and a half mile branch line, with Twyford Station serving as its main line junction. Today, up to 20,000 people will be shuttled back and forth down this single track. And every passenger on every train must have their ticket checked. Every half hour, we'll be expecting a 1,000 people to alight our trains. And there's a train coming in now, so I better get ready, because I need to get my troops ready. This way, please, have your tickets ready. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our job at Henley today is somewhat different from normal revenue protection. There is an element of revenue protection, but we're dealing with fast numbers. Thank you. Thank you. We don't normally see 10,000 people, 12,000, 15,000 people arrive in a day. Today we will. Tickets, please. We'll deal with the people. Initially, it's crowd control. Those who haven't got tickets, if we can sell them a ticket, we will do so. If it needs to be by way of a caution, the inspectors in our team are well capable of doing that and issuing penalty fares. We've got a young person's rail card. Show it to my colleague. There you are. Off go. Be careful going down the steps. Unusual excuses. We could write a book on them. We've got two tickets to go back, and that's the two tickets to come here. My mum's waiting for me. You've got a young person's rail card, please, sir. The dog swallowed it. Have you got your network card, please? I never pay. I'm a shareholder with British Rail. No, it's an outward. You've got the return on you, sir. Yeah, you must have. Is this a bus? It's a two-part return. Have you got it? One of the best ones I've ever been asked is, uh, is this the free train? I said, no, it's the one behind, sir. You've got to deal with me. 
Right, those over there buying tickets. There's a few uh, having a friendly little chat with a couple of inspectors. Gentleman over there with Mr. Fires Alati, uh, he's definitely being cautioned because I heard the police officer say you're going to be cautioned for uh, railway offences. And no doubt in due course he will get a letter from prosecution's department. Four and a half miles up the line at Twyford, the job of herding the passengers from the main line to the Henley Riverbanks falls to station managing stalwart Norman Topsom, Let's go. Let's go. who's received royal recognition for 50 years service to the railways. Right, morning. Aye, aye. The nicest part of this job is meeting people, talking to people. How are we doing? Wait. Norman, he's, he's one of the longest serving guys. He's MBE, got the MBE from the Queen for long service. Um, right, Norman's just Norman. Right. I don't come here for a perfect job. I don't want everything to go perfect every day of the week to become boring, be routine. I don't want a routine job, and this is anything but routine, I can assure you. And today is definitely not routine. There are 26 extra trains running between Twyford and Henley, the maximum possible on this single line. To keep the momentum going and prevent overcrowding, Norman has only four minutes to load up to 1,000 passengers on each train. Delays are out of the question. It's a matter of keeping the trains on time. The pressure is to clear them off the relief line. Once you start blocking trains out, you start getting problems. What goes up late comes back late. Not many here, then, you wouldn't. I want more to pay on for every head. A Saturday is always the busiest day, and for us, it's very busy, as you can see. And this is only the build-up. So as the morning wears on, we are going to be struggling a bit. Move down in the train. Go down the back end. We'll get them on, we'll get them on. You watch it, we'll get them on. This is Alex. Hello. Oh, hello. Good morning. How are you? All right. This one will be all right. It's the ones after we might struggle with. Practice makes perfect. With a lifetime's experience on the railways, dealing with extra large volumes of visitors is normally no problem. But today, even Norman may have his work cut out. Boy. <laughs> we got most of them on anyway. I think we could have got another 100 on that one, but uh, no, I mean, it was successful. Coming up, there's complicated communications at Paddington. Yeah, sometimes platform one, but it's not been confirmed. Yeah. And things are getting hairy at Henley. Uh, language. Start thinking quickly, young sir. I'm staying with my target. It's Monday morning rush hour at Paddington Station. And for 26,000 people, the commute is well underway. A special announcement for all passengers waiting to board high speed. With so many passengers and platforms, it's easy to panic here, but the station team have a secret weapon. Your ticket is valid all the way to Terminal 5, it's just you have to change the Terminal 3. A team of girls known as Welcome Ambassadors, a.k.a. Ribena Girls, patrol the platforms in purple outfits, approaching anyone who looks like they need a helping hand. People who come through every day know us as the purple girls or the Ribena girls, or there's loads of different names for us. Laurel Kinghorn's been one of Paddington's purple girls for 12 months. Our job is not only to try and improve the customer service and to go that bit, a little bit more. Um, it's also about trying to get the trains to go on time. You OK there? What's this one? As the Monday rush hour hots up, Laurel faces her first challenge of the day. Right. It's 8.30, have you come with me? Right, so it's this one here, this one here, 8.30. 
You see the 8.30 Bristol Temple Meads? Yes? If you, that's the one you're booked on. So all you need to do, there's no platform yet, no platform. So you just need to keep watching the board. And in about 10 minutes... 50% of the people we deal with don't speak a word of English. Um, and one of the main characteristics that they were looking for for our role was for people to be bilingual. I'm not. Yeah, sometimes platform one, but it's not me. So when it comes to dealing with people who we face a language barrier, it's all about how what you can do to ensure that they understand. Have you watched this one, the 8.30? Yeah, that will move along the board. Yeah? As the Monday rush hour hots up, Laurel's confronted with anything but the ideal group booking. On a Monday morning during rush hour, this is the first time I've seen a big group of kids. Hi, are you one of the teachers? Yes. Uh, I'm Laurel, I work for First Great Western. Um, what, do you, what train are you on? The 22 minutes past eight. 22 minutes past eight and you've yeah. not boarded yet? OK, I'm going to try and find a platform for you and try and get you on earlier because obviously you've all got the luggage and there's quite yes. a few kids. But what we usually do is try and get the kids on the, tra on the platform um, about 15 minutes before it starts boarding. Boarding a large group during the morning peak could cause problems. Laurel calls for assistance. Just a quick one. Um, I've got a group of school kids trying to get them on the train on the 8.22. OK, I was just going to try and get them on slightly earlier, so I was going to ring Control. I'm guessing Control won't have a confirmed platform. Do you want to call me back when you've got a confirmed platform? The moment it's scheduled to go from platform two, so they're in the right place if it is platform two. Sometimes it changes at the last minute. If it is, we'll get them on the platform, get them on the train. Yeah, like for now, it's just come up as platform nine, so they've changed the platform. If you leave it for those people to board the train with everybody else, that train will nine times out of ten leave late because it's just not feasible to get all those people onto a train and their suitcases and the rest of the public to board and find seats within a space of 15 minutes. Because it's not due until 18 minutes past, they're not going to have a confirmed platform for about 10 minutes. Have you spoke to Control? Because people are going to start boarding this. Look, there's one boarding from platform four, five, two, so we should try and move them out of the way. You hit about half eight, quarter to nine, that's when you'll see the floods of the trains. With a packed train about to pull into the station, urgent action must be taken. So in the next nine minutes, we're going to have hundreds of people coming off on platform three. Um, so ideally, I'd like to try and get these moved over as soon as possible. Definitely platform two. Yeah, I've just run control. OK. Oh, yeah, it's come in now. Should we wait for them to come off the yeah. platform first? Right, if you want to start getting them up and ready, the train's in, so we can start taking you through the gates. Have the teachers just gone to get lunch for a child that hasn't actually wanted with him? So we'll be like literally one minute, he's got the tickets. They won't be long. Laurel knows the platform number, but there's a problem. The teacher with the tickets has gone AWOL. Have they got their... Do they know which coach they're in yet? They're still waiting for someone. They're still waiting for people. Oh, there's a train coming in onto platform three. So they're, like, so in the way. Laurel needs to help keep the concourse clear to play her part in keeping the trains moving. You've got to think, if this train leaves um, Paddington one minute late, that's going to clock for minutes. It'll probably be 20 minutes along the line by the time it re reaches Hereford. With the train about to board, Laurel takes matters into her own hands. Right, can we just ping the gates open? We've got the school kids coming through. Right. If you just follow straight through, it's platform two. This is why it's so important to get them on the train. If you see, there's a lot more than I thought initially there was. All right, if you just follow it through, it's platform two, platform two. All right. The teacher arrives just in the nick of time. The only thing is, this train's going to start boarding in a minute. Can you believe how much luggage there is? You leave it here, we'll get it on. It's all right. What, are you going away for six months? Oh. Lucky I didn't go gym this morning. Right, okay, I'm going to start getting them into coach C. Sorry. You want to follow me? We get them in, I'll start getting them on the train. Are we in first class? No, it's not first class. Oh. Nearly, nearly though. No, coach C, this one here. So you want to get on? Oh my God. How much are you taking? What's in here? Sorry, watch your feet, guys. Sorry. This is heavier than what I'll take away. That's it, that's all of it. Go in the guards' department, so. 
It went better than I thought it would. See, now the train's starting to board. So it's, it was just good to get them on the train um, with that little bit of time to get them seated as well. If we didn't get those people, those kids on the train, it would have gone with at least a 10 minute late start. And if we can have play a part in that, then obviously we're doing our job properly. Hi, can we just come through? Thank you. Cheers, thank you. As you can see, I'm really out of breath now because I'm so unfit having to run all the way down to the end of the platform. And it's off to help the next bunch of puzzled passengers. 30 miles down the track at Henley, it's regatta week, with thousands of visitors pushing the rail network to capacity and revenue protection officer Dave Bunyan's busy tracking down anyone travelling without a ticket. Have you got your network card, please? Show the rail card. Have you got the ticket there? Four and a half miles up the single line at Twyford, Norman's under pressure. Oh, my God. Can't get out. And as passengers pour onto the platforms, he's only got four minutes to get them on board the train and send it back to Henley. I think we're going to struggle here. All right? Yeah, I think we're going to struggle here with this one. I think I lost count of this lot. I mean, it's well over a thousand by the look of it. And you can't move down a bit further into the train. Come on, girls. Quick. I think we might have to let this train go with only half of them. Hello, Henley, Henley. Yep. The trick is to keep the trains moving. Do not let them hang about. Great danger there. A little bit more. Do you know when the next train is? Uh, 10.46. 10 All right, so far, so good. This is the busiest one so far. Man is doing an absolutely cracking job, Norman. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely cracking job. Top man here, top man here. I've got to be nice to him, he's my manager. I won't get any overtime otherwise. The train arriving at platform four is a service for Ship Lake and Henley on Thames arriving at platform four. Now, please remain clear of the platform edge until the train comes to a stand. Talk to myself. <laughs> no, no, they're not listening. No, I'm not taking a blind bit of notice. The biggest change as regards to passengers is, or was the advent of mobile phones and iPods, things you plug in your ears. People do not listen. A lot of people are miles away. You can hear the music or rub it on the mobile phones. I mean, time was when you went in a railway lost property office, all you see was boulder hats, rolled umbrellas and briefcases. Now it's laptops iPods and mobile phones. When you board the train, move right down into the train so we can get you all in. Ah. Time to lose the loudspeaker as Norman reverts to his people skills to get the passengers on board. We'll put you all in. Sort of. It's important to let people know what's going on, to keep talking, to keep a dialogue open with the passengers. Come on, come on. That door there. If you hide, they are raging. So it's important to keep talking. That's it, that's it. Move down to the train. It's the end of his shift, and Norman's happy with the huge numbers he's helped on their way to the regatta. 6,258. Not bad, not bad. Wow. So. Mind you, that means that 6,200 people are going to come back later on. All on the same bloody train. So, Kai won't be here, I should be at home. Cheerio, bye bye. <laughs> As Norman heads home to relax, it's a different story down the line at Henley. Where Dave and his team are preparing themselves for the arrival of some less polished passengers. It's getting what they call the Larry team have arrived. This morning, you saw your traditional Henley racegoer supporting with their boating jackets and straw hats, your traditional Henley crowd. What we're seeing out arriving now in the way of passengers is a, is a young set coming in for a night out at Henley Regatta. 
And it's not long before the trouble starts. There's a group of youths all come and travel on child tickets from Reading. Um, some have admitted to being over 16. The chances are all of them are over 16. Have you got a number? I can ring them and they'll be quickly on the way. You must know your home number. You don't even know one of your parents' mobile numbers. Start thinking quickly, young sir. All I'm saying is, guys, you don't want to be out of argument. So the best thing you do is you want to move away, don't you? So, OK, that's fine. Uh, language. If I find out that you are over 16, then, unfortunately, you'll be dealt with in a different matter. Right, I will need a telephone number to verify it, right, otherwise so you're going to have to put... So no, 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 no. I'm staying with my target. If they want to circle around, they're going nowhere. And the police said, if you want to mess us about, you can put you on the next train back to wherever you came from. Goodbye, good night, hasta la vista, Henley on Thames. I'm going to ring his guardian. I'll supply, identify myself and we will see what his correct date of birth is. It's interesting to note, he was on the phone moments before, so I think I'm being um, set up for this one. But we will see. Can you confirm his address and date of birth, please? David Bunyan of First Great Western Trains. Right, OK, bear with us and I'll see what I can do. Young man. That's been confirmed, however... Despite Dave's doubts, he has to let the lad head off for Henley without a fine. OK. Right, you, you may go. All right? Enjoy the Henley. Be good. It's been a hectic year for Henley Regatta, with over 100,000 visitors. And as the crowd's clear, the station staff at Henley and Twyford can relax as the railway returns to normal for the next 12 months. We issued 20 penalty fares and collected £204.20 by way of advance payment and free reports of prosecution. No arrests, no assaults and 11,500 people came through on our shift without incident. Coming up, things go nuts on the night shift at Paddington. That is absolutely insane. Bonkers. Saturday night at Paddington Station, and the Henley Regatta crowds are rolling back in after a day on the riverbanks. I mean, you can see in this train just here now just how busy it gets here, especially when there's events on in London. Just as duty station manager Simon Jeffrey clocks on for the graveyard shift. So, what we're checking for now is um, yeah, you know, anything, anything suspicious and looking on the train would be the main thing, but also um, people tend to fall asleep, especially on these late night services, so we're just seeing if we find anybody uh, half asleep. And of course, uh, admiring the excellent state of the trains at this time of night after something like Henley. Every nine to seven night shift has its challenges, but Saturday nights are particularly painful for security and railway staff. On a Saturday night, there is just three members of First Great Western staff, myself, one dispatcher, and one of the ticket office staff. So if we do get some issues, it's quite a small team to have to work with. During the week, services run all night, but on Saturdays, track maintenance means the schedule winds down from 11 p.m., with the last train leaving at 1. You do tend to get people turn up after that time expecting there to be a service, and then never particularly pleased when you tell them, no, there's not, and your next one is potentially in five, six hours' time. Hello. 33, just let it be there. Platform. Tonight, Simon will patrol Paddington, giving service information to the late-night travellers. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, yeah! Saturday nights are particularly challenging. Um, it's when everybody goes out, so... It's, um, it's when you get the most people through here that have maybe had a touch of alcohol. They can be a challenge in themselves. Uh, which train do you need to get to for Ipswich? To where? To Ipswich? Ipswich. You have to go, right, you have to go on the underground now. We go on the underground! Oh, there we go! Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. It's quite a good example of what you get normally on a Friday and Saturday night. They are not particularly bad natured or anything, they're just very, very drunk, so it's just. You just get them to where they want to go and that's uh, the best you can do. 
I'm sure as the evening progresses, you'll, we'll find that there'll be people that'll turn up that wanting to go to different places. So, uh, Swindon, mate. Swindon, uh, there isn't any more now, I'm afraid, mate. You missed, missed that, right? 30, yeah. 33. Uh, well, sorry, 30. It left three minutes ago. Oh, sorry. Um, if you quickly go to platform nine, there's a train to big. Cars. As the 1 a.m. curfew gets closer, the passengers are pouring in. Hey, mate. Bath, bath, bath. To where? Bath Spa. Uh, you won't be able to get a Bath Spa now. If the furthest you can get is is to is to Digcot. Digcot. Yeah. So which one? You go number nine. Go down over there. That one. The step. It's just leaving now in like one minute. So you need to go there. All right. I suspect he's going to miss that train. He's gone the opposite way. So short of putting him physically on the train, there's not really much more I can do for him. So. Um, it has been afraid, yeah, it's really good 30. Um, so it's closer, you, get, you can get to Digcar, that's about the closest you can get. Yeah, you got a train that's over there, number 10. Oh, the Newbury train gone. To where? Newbury. Newbury. Yeah, you mean, uh, yeah, change it at Redden, 23.30 it was. Bearing in mind that there are only two trains left now for the rest of the day. There's a midnight 30 and a 1 o'clock service. Um, there's quite a few people still around on the station. No more to Bristol, I'm afraid, today. Next one's tomorrow morning. It's almost crunch time as the final train prepares to pull out. What we tend to do in this, with this one as well is um, have a bit of a look around the concourse just before we get rid of it, just to make sure that there's nobody running at the last minute. It's, it's not very often where you say we hold a train for a minute and not have any consequence, but at this time of night we'd rather the train stayed an extra minute and we got everybody on it rather than somebody having to sleep here the night. So it'll be interesting to see how many get left behind as well. Find that a lot of people will chance it into the very last second just so they can get themselves a Burger King <laughs> before they get the train. With the last train gone, there's no escape. The challenge is now, of course, that a lot of them are going to end up staying here overnight. Hello, mate. Hello, mate. Sorry to interrupt That's you. That's all right. Trains are running. It's um, normally one at 1.30. Yeah, unfortunately, they don't run on the sat on Saturday nights. It's every other night of the week, but not on Saturday nights. The last one's at 1 o'clock, which I've missed now. That is absolutely insane. I'm going to have to sit here till the morning, and yes. then I don't think it's unreasonable for me to go home on that ticket that I paid for. I'm sorry, but I'm I sorry you missed the last train. absolutely... Can I swear on telly? <laughs> bonkers! All right, mate. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah, he wasn't best pleased. Again, he's another person that's got caught out under the impression there was a 134 train, which there wasn't. He was obviously a little bit more vocal than most. That is unreasonable. To make a person when I've already paid for a ticket, and it wasn't cheap. He wasn't too bad. He was obviously quite drunk, so I'm willing to sort of <laughs> forgive the bad language. And he, as I said, he wasn't. A personal thing against me, he was just frustrated, Mr. Train. All we can do now is just say to them, unfortunately, next trains are 7.30, 8, 8.30 in the morning, and that they, they can stay here as well. It's not the most comfortable place in the world to sleep in, um, but then, of course, it wasn't designed as a hotel either, so... One hundred and fifty miles west of Paddington is one of the most vulnerable stretches of railway track in the country. A 13-mile section between Exeter and Tynmouth, built by Brunel in 1847. The track here runs metres from the sea and comes under constant attack from the elements. If we go and have a look at the cliff faces, um, just before Dawlish... The man with the challenge of keeping the track safe here is Network Rail's Steve Hawkins. The problems that we face in this line, obviously, is being right next to the sea. We do, in bad weather, get overwhelmed with waves and, obviously, the wind onto the railway. And that has to be maintained and inspected. It costs us £500,000 a year to maintain the sea defence. Overall, from the cliff face point of view, on a normal year, we're going to the millions. 
today, Steve's on a mission to shrink that bill and he's come up with a novel way of doing it. Steve's booked a helicopter slot with the operations team to get a panoramic perspective through the lens of an HD camera. And he's taking to the air today with aerial survey photographer Emma Taylor. I'm a National Aerial Survey Specialist. Um, basically, I go up in the helicopter, um, I operate all the camera equipment. I love this job, I do love it. <laughs> I always get excited, you know, no matter how many times I go up in the thing. Steve and Emma's mission today is to survey the area most prone to landslips so that measures can be put into place to make sure the track remains open. Yep. All secure. Don't mind me. It's the main infrastructure of railway into southern Devon and into all of Cornwall. So um, that's for freight traffic and also passenger traffic. Um, so it is key and imperative that we keep that traffic running daily for our customers. Armed with a long-range camera, Emma takes hundreds of shots of the cliffs and track for Steve's team of engineers to scrutinise for signs of damage. The camera will zone in, zoom in to um, very close detail. We also can uh, see which way the farmer's fields are, uh, have been ploughed. If they're um, lining down towards the railway, that can cause us problems. Uh, it's more prone to landslips. And you can see where you can't see green is where there's been landslips. We also have to be aware of the houses that are sat on above some of those cliff faces. And then there's the sea defence itself. Um, it can crumble away. It would be good if we had a shot, I don't know if we can, Jan, a bit lower down to look at the rock face. But no amount of surveys could have predicted the flooding which affected this area during 2012. triggering a series of landslides that forced the line to shut and stopped trains running. That's where we've had a, a rock face has crumbled over in the past. 8,100 tonnes of spoil came down over Christmas time, New Year. Uh, we're still working on that now. We have trains come in every night and we load it into wagons, um, and that's how we get it away. Um, there were 11 um, landslips um, over that Christmas New Year period. Today, it's vital that Steve and Emma gather all the information they need to predict future problems that might affect the smooth running of the rail network. Is it most important to get the top of the cliff or the side of the cliff or both? We prefer to get um, vision of the top that will help us um, see and check if there's any actual slight cracks in the rock face and whether potentially we could have any, any rock falls at all. So if you can do an orbit around the, the, the last portal wall on the other side of the, uh, the cliff there, I'll just get... Seeing the track from the air gives Steve an overview of the railway below. It's good to see the condition of the track uh, as a whole instead of just walking it. You get a, a more of a general picture of how the actual whole railway is and you can see the alignment of the track in a different detail than what you can normally. As well as helicopter flights, Steve's job has other perks. We also have our own private beaches. Because, because Brunel bought all the land, um, and some of the beaches then, they're not accessible to the public, so they're network rare land, so we've got our own beaches. Perfect. <laughs> Just trying to think to where the missus is so that seems she's got that barbecue on. They might have the shots they wanted today, but it's a constant battle to stay on top of the situation here. This is a 24-hour, 365-day operation to maintain the track and its structures, and this is one way that it helps benefit it, and it's cost-effective to do. We can look over from the footage that Emma has taken, and if we do need to visit, we can go and actually visit those specific items. So it saves a huge amount of time from a maintenance point of view. It's mission accomplished as Emma and Steve head down to Earth. Back to base for a spot of lunch and a cup of tea. <laughs> Armed with photos which will be examined for early signs of trouble on the tracks. Coming up, 
Train driver Ted Llewellyn returns to a stretch of track he'll never forget. The little one froze in front of me. He was terrified. I did think I'd had basically killed him. There's 12 months training before you can take to the tracks in the driver's seat of a 400-ton train. And only one in 100 applicants make it through. Every boy's dream is to become a train driver. It was when I was a little boy. Swansea-based Ted Llewellyn's one of the lucky ones. I'd say to any child, be a train driver. And Ted's made his childhood ambitions a reality. That beep there was the signaling system going to a green signal. You get a kind of buzz of, of driving a train. Well, I always like driving past my house. It is the fastest bit of line in Wales, 100 mile an hour. This morning, Ted's at the helm of the 945 return leg of the Swansea to Paddington service, navigating one of the network's formidable fleet of 54 high-speed trains. Throughout the journey, Ted's foot must remain pressed down on the dead man's pedal. That means the driver's vigilance. Basically, it goes off and I gotta release my foot back onto the pedal. If I don't do that within three seconds, it, uh, the brakes will go in, which I can't recover the brake. I'll have a, a warning for a speed restriction of 85 mile an hour coming up. There. If I don't press that within a couple of seconds, the computer will actually brake for me, but it'll put the brakes in hard. Always activity in the cab. Concentration level has got to be high. That's telling me I'm actually on the 85 now. To ensure that they stay at the top of their game throughout their working lives, train drivers sit a series of inspections, and this morning it's Ted's turn. Coming into Reading now, and Ian Rowland, my driver manager from Swansea, is going to come aboard and give me a driving assessment all the way back to Swansea. Driver's got a very responsible job. So a part of my job is ensuring that every driver at Swansea reaches the standards required that the company lay down. Hey, Ted, right? Come out for assessment, right? It's nice to be out and about in this weather, on not it? Get out of the office. Yeah, definitely. It's the best day, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. And we got the best seat in the train, man. Yeah? Absolutely. For 120 miles from Reading to Swansea, Ted's skills will be scrutinised. So, Ted, what do you feel it takes to be a professional driver? I prepare for this shift yesterday. Because I was getting up at 20 to 4 this morning for a 5 o'clock book on, I was in bed last night, 7 o'clock. How do you approach platforms? We're just approaching Swindon now, and I'm going to come in around about 30 mile an hour, nice and safe. I'm always cautious of platforms, because you can be distracted, and obviously with people on the platform. I've seen many, many things. Fighting on stations, I've seen people being pushed off in front of me on platforms. You get people dancing in front of you. You get women stripping off in front of you. Nice, smooth, comfortable stop for the passengers behind. I was threatened one day that I was 40 minutes late, which was nothing to do with me. It was signalling problems up line. Ted's skills are being scrutinised today along a route which takes him through the 140-year-old Severn Tunnel, which joins England and Wales. Just over four miles long, they're dropping down the English side, which is straight. Just before the bottom, hopefully you'll get two blue lights so that you know when you're a freight driver to start powering up so that you get out the other side so you don't stop halfway up. It's got 36 emergency phones in, two pumping stations. One goes down, the other one kicks in, and if the backup one don't kick in, the tunnel will flood in less than three minutes. To see how steep it is, I will get just 75. I've actually got a little bit of wheel slip going on as well. Troy Chile, Gumbry, welcome to Wales. So this time of year now, 
hot weather, what risks do you take in consideration? Keep hydrated. Make sure the air conditioning is working. Don't get too hot. You can become more fatigued due to the weather being hot. Concentration levels go down, you're making mistakes. The new generation of high-speed trains are equipped with cutting-edge kit to keep the driver informed of every delay or disruption to his journey. We've got a new system, the GSMR. The signaler can inform my train. You can send me a message to stop the train. If it was an incident on the track, I'd hit the red button straight away then. A year ago, on this section of track, Ted saw a scene he can't forget. Coming back from London and two young boys, one was having a drink, one was eating a sandwich, sitting on the on the actual running line. As I'm trying to do, blow the horn, break into emergency. The one boy got off, but the little one froze in front of me. He was terrified. I always remember being like this, because I was looking at the boy like that. My concentration was was basically trying to tell him to get off, get off. I knew I didn't really hit the one, but couldn't guarantee I hadn't hit him. But the, the youngest of the two, I did think I had struck him. I did think I'd had basically killed him because there was no way he'd ever survive an HST coming towards him 90 mile an hour. I had a phone call. It was a British Transport Police Sergeant, and he said, look, we've got them. We've got the two boys. I, I never, ever want to go through that again. I think you killed a little kid, you know? To every driver's worst nightmare. After two and a half hours of assessment, Ted's train pulls into Swansea Station and he awaits the outcome of his examination. I was happy with your performance. You're aware of, of track work as you sounded horn in the right area. I like the way you control the speed of the train as well. You broke nice and early and light. So, no, well done, Ted. Generally, uh, good performance. Thank you very much. Next time on the railway, it's student night at Reading. Don't throw up a bus station, will you? <laughs> a broken down train at Paddington puts everyone to the test. Still chaos. This is called skin of your teeth. Hold fire, hold fire. And tempers flare up at Didcot. 25 yards up the station. I've never known anything like it in 45 years of travel.